Welcome to a very special episode of Crime Crazy, the weekly true crime podcast with Erin Plyme and Diana Seacombe, where we prove. So here's a spoiler, you guys. We found out some things about our legal system. We did. And that is what we are going to share with you today. So this is going to be a very different kind of episode because it's probably not going to be very funny. No. Uh, it's going to be really real. Yeah. It's going to be really personal. Mm -hmm. And it has a very distinct goal. Go vote. Go vote. So before we get into why you should go vote, um, I do want to give a warning. Yes. And in general, I don't believe in warnings for true crime shows because... It's a true crime show you should know. Right. Like, if you haven't figured out that it's going to be real rough, like, I can't help you. <laughs> um, but I do want to point out that this show is going to be focusing on sexual assault, and it's going to be graphic, and it's going to be uncomfortable. Yes. And if this is content that you cannot handle at this point, we honor your decision to skip this episode and join us next week when we'll talk about, you know, murder. Murder. Cannibal More friendly stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so create a safe space for yourself. Mm -hmm. Please go vote. Yes. See you next week. This doesn't follow the traditional format. Nope. So we're not going to do what I learned. There won't be any bloopers. Um, I don't promise that. Okay, I'm, not going to, <laughs> I'm not going to include them. Um, but we did learn a lot this week. Diana, especially because stats and numbers and calculations and facts are are the things that make her heart go pitter patter Whoa. so she has a lot of good things um yeah, i have a lot of bad things. that's true she has a lot of bad things i have a lot of good share. numbers about bad things right so the idea for this came about for a couple reasons one the news mm. and two it's crime cozy all month long we told you horrific things and how it was never ever going to happen to you but unfortunately, there is one super horrific thing that's probably going to happen to you or someone sitting right next to you at some point in your life. Probably has. So do you want to start us out? So let's talk a little bit about why, why we're doing this. Um, next week, we in the U.S. will be voting in the midterm elections. Yes. And I'm not a politician, but um, I believe this is probably the most important election in modern times. Yes. If you are not registered to vote and or not planning to vote, I would ask you to reconsider. I'm also going to uh, send a special shout out to people like me because I tend to vote for third party candidates. I think yeah. our two party system is broken. I think there are a lot of benefits to third party candidates. If third party candidates get more than 5% of the popular vote, they qualify for major campaign status and that's a big deal. Blah, 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 blah. Fuck all of that. Yeah. Vote for a major party. Vote for a Democrat. I don't care if you don't like him. I don't care if they're Keith Ellison. I don't fucking like him either. I'm still going to vote for him because the other guy is a racist, homophobic nut job. Right. If you don't like what is going on in this country, your best bet to help fix that is to elect a Democrat in your state this next week. This is especially true if you are living in West Virginia, North Dakota, Missouri, Montana, Indiana, Florida, Nevada, Arizona, Tennessee, or Texas. Please vote. Please vote for a Democrat. This is also a particularly important election for women, people of color, and non-binary people. The rhetoric and policy coming from the White House and other elected officials has made it abundantly clear that they do not give a fuck about us. No. And that equalizing our rights with that of white men is not only not a priority, but something they are actively fighting against. As two middle class, middle aged or so. <laughs> I don't know. You're a lot older than me, Diana. Hey, now. White women. We don't have the knowledge or life experience to talk about the experiences of people of color or non-binary people or any other marginalized group. We benefit from a, a very high degree of white privilege. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is that women, any women, all women, do not have equal rights and are at best second class citizens in this country. We now have two known sexual assaulters on the Supreme Court. 27 years after I watched Anita Hill testify 
about her sexual harassment at work, we are in no better place than we were in the 90s. And that fucking abuser is still on the Supreme Court. And now we have a new one. Right. And it's not like a four-year thing. It's not like we'll get another chance to get rid of him. No. This is it. He is there forever. And he is young. And he'll be deciding cases about sexual assault, which is something he's obviously cool with. He's obviously cool with. He's obviously cool with restricting our right to choose, restricting our right to birth control, restricting our right to vote. Restricting our rights. Underreporting is rampant in sexual assault. And numbers are even higher than you think they are. The number that you hear thrown around in the media a lot is that two out of three women have suffered a sexual assault in their lifetimes. I've never met that other woman. Mm -mm. Ask the women in your life. I don't know a single woman, a single woman in my 43 years that has not been sexually abused, assaulted, or harassed. Not one. Yeah. Well, so is this a good time to discuss what sexual assault is? Let's do that. Can we define it? Ooh, can we? Can we? So that was one of the things that we talked about uh, the other day about, like, If we're going to do a whole episode about sexual assault, we need to be very clear what we mean Mm -hmm. by sexual assault. Legally, that's really not possible. Yeah. Every state is different. The definitions have a lot of a lot of wiggle room. Often things that seem like clear cut rape, like sexual penetration against your will, don't count because of some sort of loophole. I went on one of my favorite I don't want to say my favorite groups, but like favorite resources, Mm -hmm. um, which is RAIN. So the Rape and Incest National Network. And they have a section of their site on that's about sexual assault. And it gives some, it attempts to give some definition. So the big thing here is that it's a legal term and every state defines it differently. And so there's not just one definition for sexual assault, but I think this is a pretty good summary. So they break it down to a ton of categories, um, but it, and I'm going to read directly from their site. So what is sexual assault? The term sexual assault refers to sexual contact or behavior that occurs without explicit consent of the victim. And so this can include things like attempted rape, fondling or unwanted sexual touching, forcing a victim to perform sexual acts like oral sex or penetrating the perpetrator's body, penetration of the victim's body, also known as rape. And they go through and they talk about like, what is force? Is it you have to physically like hold the person down? Is it, um, you know, something that you can do to them mentally and emotionally? And really, I think most of our stats will deal with, would you say they're legal definitions of like something you could press charges against? Not necessarily. So... There there are a lot of numbers around sexual assault. There are numbers that are kept by individual governments and the FBI around the legal definitions of sexual assault as they apply in that state. Um, there was actually a bigger survey that was recently done, and I'll get to that when we get to that part, that was a much larger survey. It used a much broader definition of sexual assault, although they did not list what that was because I wasn't reading the primary source paper. Mm-hmm. My bad. Um But it was also a much more representative sample of America as a whole. They asked more men, they asked more people of color, blah, blah, blah. Um, And they found much higher rates than reported through normal channels. Right. Would you define it as any sort of contact, physical contact? Or would you include like verbal sexual harassment and threats and that kind of thing? I mean, I'm not a lawyerologist. (laughs) But... I mean, assault by definition is you have to Mm -hmm. touch. Um, However, where's that line between sexual harassment and sexual assault? If somebody makes a, you know, unwelcome joke in the office, is that assault? Eh, I don't know. Right. If a senior executive dirty dances you at a company function, (laughs) is that sexual assault if he doesn't actually touch you and it's just creepy as fuck? Right. I don't know. So does... These are all things that I don't know because I don't know anything about our legal system. (laughs) Right. Does just assault assault. Like if we take the sexual out because apparently that is where the problem 
comes in because I yeah. feel like assault is really well defined. Right. And we know it's not okay. And when it happens, we go, oh my God, that wasn't okay. Let's punish someone. And right. then you put sexual in there and all of a sudden there are different rules. Well, there are different rules and there are different rules depending on who you are. Right. Are you a married person? Well, it might be that there's no such thing as sexual assault by your spouse because marriage implies consent in your state. Right. Um, you know, if I go over there and give you a titty twister, is that sexual assault or am I just an asshole? Right. But where's that line? Right. Would it be different if I didn't know you? Would it be different if one of us were gay? Would it be different if... You're my boss. Right. I or mean, my aunt. Right. So... In regular assault cases, if I threaten you with a weapon, is that an attempted assault or is it actually an assault? Like if I were to rob you at gunpoint, mm -hmm. is that also assault with a deadly weapon if I don't shoot you? Yes. So. Because assault is. So when you look at, and again, not a lawyerologist, but assault is, I always think of assault as like coming at you mm -hmm. and battery is when the contact is made. So then sexual assault should include any sort of threat. Yeah. But, I mean, I think that's the thing. Like, I feel like we should, as human beings, be able to have that conversation and have everybody understand that there is appropriate conversation, appropriate touching, appropriate lines, and that you have to know that what you're doing is okay with the other person and isn't going to hurt anyone. Right. Well, and it varies on the group too. And in fact, I've had conversations with men that we work with because the company we work for is a very huggy company. It is. Like Especially just, here. Yes. But we're just, we are very huggy. Yeah. Which I love. I love to hug people. I mm -hmm. love the people we work with. It's a win-win for me. No, I agree. But um, that is something I was actually talking to. He doesn't work at our company anymore, but we were talking about that about when is that okay like mm -hmm. he said as a man and, and a man who is a very strong feminist and and yeah um, you know in all of that he said like am I still okay to hug you and I'm like a hundred percent right but he asked the question because now even as a man with good intentions that I know well enough that if he were making me uncomfortable I would say something and there would not be retaliation because he's a good human being right he asked me the question but but After knowing him for several years. Right. How hard is that? <laughs> it's not, but it's still like there are other companies where it would have been like, you know what? No, it's not okay. Yeah. This has more of a social norm and I don't feel pressured into it. If I wasn't a hugger, like I don't feel like that's a situation. No. Well, one of the people that we work with that we spend quite a bit of time with mm. is not, he doesn't like to be touched. Yeah. He just doesn't like it. So fine. All right. So we we still sit there and have any kind of conversation and go out for drinks and, you know, socialize and have a very close relationship. He doesn't want his bubble popped. Like, right. So don't. Right. I'm not going to do it. No, <laughs> no, not absolutely not. Assume so that I have the right to do it because I'm okay with it. Like, right. I don't. That's what sort of gets me about all the sexual assault stuff. Like, why would you? I, I understand that it's about power and I understand that, you know, sometimes it's about sex. Like, I know the list of reasons, but as a human being, I just can't imagine being like, you know what? I feel like I deserve this. I'm going to go ahead and take it. Well, but let's look at the broader picture here. We have a lot of our society that thinks that that's okay in whatever reason. Yeah. You know, I was talking about the show we were watching, Dirty Money on Netflix. Y'all should check it out. But we were talking about this guy that ran payday loan businesses, and he thinks he's absolutely right. He is moral. He did the right thing. He was acting legally. He did all of these things. Lots of people think that about the way that they think. And when I think about, you know, members of my own family who think I'm a fucking nut job for thinking that people deserve equal rights and that I as a woman deserve to, you know, have a career and and all of those things... This is a huge swath of our society. It is. That we need to vote out of office. So and vote. <laughs> so then I would say for the sake of this podcast that we're defining sexual assault pretty broadly. Yes. I think that's, that's safe to say. Um, I think that, well, I don't know that our experiences are particularly clear cut that we're going to talk about. Mine is definitely not. No. Uh, actually, and I may talk about both of them because you know why only do it once um 
And why not just really bring it? <laughs> or just do all it. But but no, I wouldn't say that either are necessarily clear cut. And in one case, I'm not sure it was legal. Technically, by state law. Well, and I I brought up the marital rape thing a couple of times because frankly uh, I was married before to a horrible human being and that was a thing in our marriage all totally cool because he never hit me right right so I bet you have a lot more numbers and facts for us oh my gosh so many before you do that guys go vote vote that is the whole point of this episode and I realize that sexual assault is not like the one issue this election but it is a huge issue. Well, and it's not just sexual assault. The fact of the matter is that women's rights are being attacked. Yes. The rights of people of color are being attacked. Trans people's rights are being attacked. Non-binary people's rights are being attacked. Well, some of them may or may not exist. <sighs> I very well may cut this, but I just want you all to know that as I feel like we're pretty good about being open and talking about that. And like we have some liberal views, but like we're some. pretty... Some. <laughs> We're pretty set in them and willing to talk about them and willing to openly discuss things about our personal lives. And yet... It, it ruined my whole weekend. I'm not going to lie. That and the working. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, yeah, this particular podcast definitely has had me anxious for a while. But this topic, um, years of therapy. Yeah. Oh, 100%. So according to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center... One in five women and one in 71 men will be raped at some point in their lives. In the U.S., one in three women and one in six men experience some form of sexual uh, contact, sexual violence in their lifetime. Again, that seems real low. Yeah. 51% of female victims of rape reported being raped by an intimate partner and 40.8% by an acquaintance. That's 92% for those of you that didn't want to pull out your calculators. So almost everyone knows their attacker, which yep. we sort of have been, that's been a theme this month. Yep. If someone's going to hurt you, you know them. Yep. 52.4% uh, of male victims report being raped by an acquaintance and 15.1% by a stranger. Almost half, 49.5% of multiracial women and over 45% of Native American or Alaska Native women were subjected to some sort of sexual contact violence in their lifetimes. 91% of victims of rape and sexual assault are female and 9% are male, although we will see in the next study that is low. Yeah. In 8 out of 10 cases of rape, the victim knew the perpetrator, and 8% of rapes occur when the victim is at work. Which seems just insane to me. And I guess I've just always had a job where there are lots of people around, but it never occurs to me to be worried about the people I work with. Even when I've worked with real shitheads, it never occurred to me to be nervous about them. You haven't worked with some of the people I have. No. In the wake of the Me Too movement, a nonprofit called Stop Street Harassment conducted a new survey about the prevalence of sexual harassment and assault. And this survey used a larger, uh, more nationally representative sample of men and women aged 18 and above and a broader definition of sexual harassment that includes the continuum of experience that victims faced. Those, uh, that study found that 81% of women and 43% of men have experienced some sort of sexual harassment during their lifetime. And they included things like verbal sexual harassment, unwelcome sexual touching, cyber sexual harassment, being physically followed, unwanted genital flashing, and sexual assault. <laughs> so those numbers still seem low. Um, but again, this is, this is very underreported. And you may be asking hmm. why I can't talk no more. <laughs> You may be I'm asking, not asking that. I know. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. So you may be asking, what did victims do about their sexual harassment or assault? Stressed, lost sleep, worried, and kept quiet. Oh, that's, that's the next bar graph. Um, feeling anxious or depressed, changed their route or regular routine, ended a relationship, such as a friendship or a romantic relationship, filed an official report. Only 10% of women and 5% of men file any sort of report with an authority figure. Yep. Changed jobs, quit a new job, sought a new job assignment, sought medical help, including mental health counseling, stopped a hobby activity or stopped participating in a community, moved from a dorm apartment house or other form of residence, changed schools, dropped out of school or dropped a course, confronted the person. 1% uh, for each. That's so low. 
So why don't victims come forward? Mm. There's a really excellent article in Psychology Today that you should have a look at. But it laid out several uh, different reasons why people don't come forward. Number one is shame. Mm -hmm. The victim feels invaded and defiled, um, but they also simultaneously experience the indignity of being helpless and at the mercy of another person. This sense of shame often causes victims to blame themselves. It is easier to blame oneself than to admit that you are rendered helpless or victimized. Women in particular feel shame because they are often blamed for being sexual assaulted. What did she expect when she dressed like that? She was asking for it. Why did she have so much to drink? Why was she out with those people? Why was she out alone? Right. She flirted with him. Yep. Uh, the other, uh, another reason is denial and minimalization. Yeah. Uh, many women refuse to believe that the treatment they endured was abusive. They downplayed how much they've been harmed by sexual assault. They convinced themselves that it wasn't a big deal. Um, other women are really good at making excuses for their abusers. And finally, women will convince themselves that they are the only victim. They're not. They're not, but it's easy to see why you would think that when nobody else is reporting it and those that do are being shot down. Yep. Fear of consequences is another big one. Fear of repercussion, fear of losing jobs, fear they won't find another job, fear they'll be passed over, losing credibility, being branded a troublemaker, being blackballed, fear of their physical safety. Fear of the president making fun of you? <sighs> Christ. Uh, many don't disclose because they don't think they'll be believed. The fact that sexual misconduct is the most underreported crime is due to a common belief that women make up these stories for attention or to get back at a man who rejected them. Victims' accounts are often scrutinized to the point of exhaustion. In high-profile cases, victims are labeled as opportunists, blamed for their own victimization, and punished for coming forward. Well, and it's... So it's tricky, too, because so often I feel like it's something that there's not a ton of physical proof. No, there's usually no physical proof. Right, and so, yeah, that's a scary thing to be like, I'm going to tell you this. It's something you don't want to hear. And I'm going to ask you to just believe it. Yep. Like, no, chances are pretty good you won't. Yeah, no, 100%. And we'll talk uh, a lot more about that later. Uh, low self-esteem. Some victims have such low self-esteem they don't consider what happened to them to be serious. Uh, little by little, acts of disrespect, objectification, and shaming whittle away at self-esteem until a woman has little regard for herself and her feelings. Feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. Research has shown that victims who cannot see a way out of an abusive situation soon develop uh, learned helplessness, and they give up and stop trying to seek help. Women feel it's useless to come forward because they've seen the way others have been treated. They know they won't be believed, and their reputations will be tainted if not ruined. History being sexually violated. The more you are violated, the more likely you are to be violated, and the less likely you are to report it. Lack of information. Many women, even highly educated ones, are uneducated about what constitutes sexual harassment. Uh, no shit, because it's real vague. Right. And, and dependent on the state. And dependent <sighs> on lots of little loopholes. And Yep. <sighs> they don't recognize sexual harassment as a real threat. They don't understand how it affected them. Nor do they understand the real world consequences of not reaching out for help or not reporting it. This can have huge emotional psychiatric effects such as anxiety, loss of self-esteem, PTSD, and suicidal behavior. And then finally, disbelief, disassociated, or drugged. Some women don't report sexual harassment or assault because at the time of the abuse they were drugged, inebriated, or disassociated. It usually takes more than one woman coming forward before a woman is able to trust her own memories of the experience. But the baseline question here isn't why don't women come forward? It's why do we continue to allow and normalize sexually abusive behavior in this society? So let's take a minute to talk about false allegations, since that seems to be something that is all over the place right now. Oh, my God. If I see that video or that meme or what, one more time about mothers of sons should be so worried. We are both mothers of sons. Are you worried someone is going to accuse Liam wrongly? If he ever gets accused, I will fucking cut his dick off. Right. It doesn't happen. It it happens. It doesn't happen. It doesn't. 
So I am just infuriated by the number of Facebook and other social media posts I've seen about what a shame it is that our men are being subjected to false allegations. There's even a hashtag, hashtag protect our boys. Yes. So to these assault apologists, I have two things to say. Number one, according to the Sexual Violence Resource Center, false reporting of sexual assault is between 2 and 10%, depending on how you define false. Sometimes these are just unsubstantiated or there's not enough evidence to bring charges. Not so, that it didn't happen, it's that there's not enough evidence. Research shows that rates of false reporting are frequently inflated in part because of inconsistent definitions and protocols. Sure. Number two, fuck you. Yeah. Believe women. So we know that about 70% of our audience is female. And if our anecdotal data is correct, and anecdotal data is in general bullshit, but we're going to go with it. We know that every single one of you, every single one of you has faced unwanted comments, unwanted touching, harassment, and or rape. You all have your own stories. These are ours. Okay. Um... All right, so I I have more than one story, we and all do. Um, yeah, but my first one I was fourteen, and I had an older boyfriend, and that was very cool. He could drive. <gasps> I know, Ooh. I know, and I really liked him for like a second. <laughs> Because um, you were 14 and that's how that goes. Yeah. Well, and I was getting attention from somebody who could drive. Like, holy shit. That is pretty awesome. Right. I was only just four. I had just turned 14 because this was the summer. I have a late May birthday. This mm. was like July. Um, and so we made plans a bunch of times. Mom, I'm so sorry about all this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, to sneak for me to sneak out and he would get off work from his fast food job and I would we lived like in the middle of nowhere and so I would go up and we'd hang out in his car and of course his intention the entire time was sex and I probably knew that and so the first time but did you like when I was 14 I just wanted to hold hands with a boy yeah I I think I probably knew that would eventually be something not so much like the first time I snuck out. Right. Like that probably the first time we made out sex, like mm, <laughs> that yeah. was not my plan. Right. Um, but I would say probably the first time I agreed. Like I didn't want to, but I'm not sure that he would have known. So I feel like he has a little bit of plausible deniability, even though there was a ton of emotional pressure and everything else. However, after that, then it was just assumed. Ugh. And there wasn't an explicit threat. And there wasn't violence. But it was definitely not something I wanted to do. It was definitely something that I tried to make arrangements so that we weren't alone together. So that it couldn't be possible. Mm -hmm. um, although he was really good at working that out. So that was... <laughs> That wasn't an issue. Mm. Um, but I just remember, like, I mean, I was miserable about the whole thing. Although, also 14 and miserable a total in idiot. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he used to say these things uh, where he would just describe, like, horrible, horrible things that he would do to me. And it was supposed to be like a, like a kidding thing. I didn't feel threatened by it exactly. Like, he didn't say it like a threat. But, like, discussing... What sort of horrible, like, condom inventions he could think of with razor blades or rusty nails or blah, blah, blah. And I, I don't, like, thinking back about it now, I cannot think of a context where I wouldn't have, like, run screaming. Um, but, yeah, it was just sort of that really, really unhealthy, awful, I couldn't get out of it, I was in over my head kind of situation. And after the first time, it wasn't like I felt like I could say no. Right. I, Worst case scenario, I was probably afraid that he would tell everyone or tell my parents or, you know, it would be a big issue socially, which when you're 14 is kind of the whole world. Well, in 14, in a small town. A very small town. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was, that sucked. Yeah. <laughs> um, I one time managed to say no enough that he stopped so let's take a minute to revisit consent 
Enthusiastic. Yeah. Revocable. Yeah. Continuous. Yep. You can never assume somebody wants to do you. No. Or wants you to do... Either way, you can't assume people want to sleep with you. Right. Right. So I feel like that that is a tricky one. I definitely feel like that should count as rape because I know I didn't want to. I know he knew that I wasn't interested. Right. It didn't feel like there was any way for me to say no. Um, well, and I know he knew that. Well, especially at that age when... I mean, cars were date locations. Yeah. And what if you'd said no and he'd kick you out of the car? Where the hell are you? Yeah. In the middle of nowhere, alone. 2 a.m. Yeah. 14 years old. Side of the road. Wow, you are much much better 14-year-old than I was. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we sort of lived in the middle of nowhere, so it wasn't hard to get there. But No, but... (sighs) Yeah, I just... um, or, Or in various other places, like... It was never a safe place. It was never a romantic thing at all. It was like, oh, I found a way for us to be away from parents for a minute. Guess what we're going to do? Right. So, but I was looking at Virginia state law and I didn't, I didn't read through like the actual legal wording and I'm not sure I totally understand it if I did, but I am not sure that anyone would have taken that case if I had come forward, which I certainly did not. Um, I don't know that it's clear cut enough that anyone would be willing to charge him. Right. Or that he'd be convicted if he was charged. Right. Well, and that's the thing. That's the, you know, especially if you weren't explicit. Right. If you didn't, you know, fight, which didn't sound right. like you had to, like he wasn't harming you. No. Like physically. No. But no, it comes down to, I didn't want to, he talked me into it. Right. I felt like I couldn't say anything else right but there wasn't an explicit threat well there wasn't an an explicit power relationship he wasn't a teacher he wasn't right your my boss boss, uh, right you know right he was your boyfriend right and i didn't immediately break up with him right like it was i allowed that relationship to continue and i never said anything to anyone and so i think that is what makes me the most angry about like all of the things in my like I didn't do anything and because I didn't do anything I don't feel like I have the right to say this happened and it wasn't okay bullshit I know I know that but that's where I that's what you know that's how it feels but that's also what we've been conditioned to right feel a like you don't get to say no like that's not that's not ever a conversation that was had when I was growing up or when I was becoming sexually active like, you had a boyfriend. You slept with him. Right. That's what you did. Right. And if you didn't want to, then he wouldn't be your boyfriend. Right. Like, if you don't want to sleep with someone, don't date them. Right. That's the only thing. That's right. what dating is. Right. And when they end up being weird, you dump them. Right. <laughs> and if you don't, or if you sleep with them, or what, then you have no right to say anything because you asked for it. <sighs> Well, and it gets back to kind of my perpetual question, because I'm thinking about a guy I dated in my 20s who I did dump because he was rough and wouldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And I made it known. He made it known. That's how he liked it. I was done. Like, I just, I couldn't put up with that. But, like, that was kind of revolutionary. Yeah. To to stop somebody because I didn't like the way they had sex with me. Right. Um, But again, even at that point, it wouldn't have occurred to me... He didn't force me. I mostly willingly consented until I didn't. Right. And then I just said things like, I don't, I don't like that. I don't want it. That's too hard. You know, whatever. And he kept doing it. So we like, I dumped him because that's not how I like to do things. Um, but even at that point, like, I remember telling people like, why'd you guys break up? He seemed great. Yeah. He was fucking rough and bad. I didn't like it. Right. And he refused to do anything else. Right. No, that was what he wanted. We were sexually incompatible is what right. it comes down to. Right. But you don't hear that a lot. And we don't, I mean, at least when we were kids, we weren't giving girls tools to say no. We weren't telling boys that 
it's not just that there's no no there has right. to be a yes right an enthusiastic yes enthusiastic, not a coerced yes continuing yes yeah so yeah that's a little bit less of a traditional clear cut thing right but but it's definitely lack of consent mm-hmm. lack of consideration you feared repercussion mm-hmm. you know i think that fits and especially since like it has I don't want to say damaged you. But Well no, but I think but it, so. But it's it definitely has. affected me and there was definitely therapy and there was definitely a lot of that I think minimization and yep. like, well, maybe it was my fault. Maybe I maybe it wasn't right. Maybe it was, you know it, Right. Um and then messed with relationships for many years. Oh yeah. Like absolutely. then I was really bad at it. And and it's still I mean I have been happily married for almost two decades. I have been with my husband since I was 14. So later that year. <laughs> <laughs> Things move fast when you're 14. It's true. I mean, it was like a full year later, but um, it still crops up in our sex life occasionally now. And oh, yeah. we grew up together. Like, so yeah, yeah, definitely still. So anyway. Now it's your turn. I say cheerfully, which sounds totally wrong for this episode. Buckle in. I'm ready. No, I'm not. (laughs) Keep drinking. (laughs) It was my 37th birthday. That's my next birthday. Except for this, 37 was a pretty good year. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So it's my 37th birthday, and I was working for... I don't know if I've talked about this job on the podcast, but I I worked for a couple of online schools. Mm. Uh, For profit, spectacularly shut down. Mm. Uh, So I I was working for one of these schools and it uh, was a teacher and it went in five week uh, sessions. Yeah. And so I literally had no time off because if you wanted like a week off, you had to take the whole session off. There was no subbing. There was none of that shit. So I hadn't had a week off in a couple of years. Wow. Right. So it was my birthday. I'd had no time on f- forever. And my birthday fell in the middle of the week. Liam was in preschool. And I didn't have to teach until that night because I was teaching night classes. And I thought, I'm going to take myself out for a massage. That sounds nice. I do really like massages. And my massage therapist is male. So this story seems like it's really bad. But I think he's super nice. <laughs> <laughs> not sketchy <laughs> yeah no well and so this was a last minute decision i don't have a regular massage therapist um and also apparently you need to call ahead for that shit <laughs> <laughs> depends on the place but good places yeah generally <laughs> well right but i like at this point i hadn't even like i've never been a re- regular massage getter i am right. you know like i feel tension and i'm like i should go have that dealt with i don't have a regular person i don't have any yeah. of this yeah. So, and I had some constraints. I had to be home by this time. I had to pick Liam up. Jeff was at work. Like, (laughs) everything had to work out right. And the only place that it was going to work out right and get me home in time to pick up my kid and, like, make my birthday dinner or whatever I was doing that night was at a place called Massage Envy in Roseville. Oh, my God. I used to have a subscription to the Massage Envy in Newport News. Yeah, you're not going to do that again. Oh, well, they were, they were, (laughs) like, I know we shouldn't pick and choose companies they are a terrible company and their contracts are total bullshit are they so anyway i didn't know this place made an appointment seemed fine show up at my appointment time and i was introduced to wade who was my massage therapist at the time Hmm. so my first impression of him was that he was a creeper he has one of those mustaches that goes all the way down to the chin like all the way down drooping. and i've always thought that is just the creepiest goddamn version of facial hair and that's a choice so like that's <laughs> right, fine right 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 <laughs> so i'm looking at this guy and he's got creeper facial hair and i'm like oh i don't know about you and then in my head i'm like you're being a judgmental bitch go get a massage he's probably a nice guy right. he works for a major corporation if new well and also like probably lots of nice people have that mustache right. i don't really know what my association is with that it's just like anybody see him like mm-mm <laughs> So I just, I was like, get over yourself. This, this is fine. Go get a damn massage. I'm not sure that haircuts and 
facial hair and all that shouldn't be. I mean, you know they make questionable decisions. Well, true. True, 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 true. Although hindsight, like, I'm assuming right. this guy is as creepy as his mustache, so. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be talking to you about it. Right, if right. He wasn't. So I was asked to undress to my level of comfort, and mm-hmm. because I have no fucks left, it was all the way. Oh. Um, I like really hard massages. I, yes. I, I like to be pounded. Yes. Um, <laughs> Just not in the bedroom. Nope. Nope. Like a gentle there. Probably TMI. <laughs> so I like I like it really hard. Like, I've definitely been like, oh, I'm sorry. Was that too hard? No. Keep going. Put some elbow in there. Right. <laughs> like, right. Let's do this. And he was doing a good job. The only thing I didn't like about him is he kept talking, which I don't like. <laughs> oh, see, I do. And so that would be my only complaint against the guys go see right now is uh-huh. that he doesn't talk. Yeah. I, I, that is like my comfort thing. Like when I'm in an uncomfortable situation, if we can talk, I'm good. Uh, oh, no. And he doesn't. Oddly, I don't like to talk. I like to talk in <laughs> almost all other situations. But uh, no, like you turn on some of that trippy Zen music and make things yeah. smell nice and like pound me hard. I'm good. <laughs> You need to stop saying uh, about me. Hard. That is hard. There needs to be a better word for like deep muscle, deep tissue massage. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do that. <laughs> um so he he was a little chatty. All right, fine. I couldn't think of a nice way to be like, dude, shut up. Right. <laughs> I don't want to talk about things. I just want you to give me a massage. So um uh, I, because I've worked in HR and I used to be a recruiter and all that, I always want to know how people got into their jobs. So I asked him how he got into massage therapy. So he told me that he'd been a truck driver, but that was a hard and lonely job, which it is. Yeah. So he decided to become a massage therapist and he hadn't been doing it very long, but really thought it was a great career move for him. Really what he was called to do. Mm -hmm. So we were nearing the end of our time together when he reached under the sheet that was covering me and ran his fingers between the inner and outer lips of my labia and then kept going as if nothing happened. Uh, um, in what world is that ever? Who thinks like, oh, you know what I should do? Guys with creepy mustaches. Apparently. So I was frozen. Uh, which yeah. is a very typical response after a sexual assault. I wasn't even sure if it had really happened because it was so different from all of the other movements that had been made. Right. Um, I just, I didn't know what to do. So he finished up. He left the room so I could put my clothes back on. And then, you know, they always come back into the room to walk you out. Right. So he came back in the room and it's tiny. You yeah, know, it's, it's a, a massage little, therapist yeah. room. It's a tiny little room. So I got dressed and he's by the door and I walk past him to go out the door. And he says to me, I gave you a little something extra. Asshole. <sighs> what the fuck? No. So, so I don't know if I actually said the words out loud, but in my head, the response was, I noticed. But not in a thank you for that kind of way. No. And and again, I don't know whether I said the words out loud. Right. Um, I, I have no idea. And you went out to the desk and asked to use the phone and called 911. No. I went to the desk and I paid and I probably left him a nice tip because that's what I do. It was a waitress. I tip well. Right. Um, I don't remember the rest of the day, probably because it was unremarkable i picked my kid up i went home i probably made myself a birthday dinner might have ordered out don't remember but there was cake involved because it was my birthday and there better have been right you would have remembered <laughs> if there wasn't cake right i would have remembered there was cake i'm pretty sure i taught a class that night or two because it was a weeknight that i would have done that right and so then the next morning you were like holy shit now that i've had a chance to think about this i should tell someone didn't talk to anybody for a year uh-huh. Uh, I didn't say anything to my husband. I didn't talk to my girlfriends. Surely did not go to the police. Just forgot about it. Tried to forget about it. So here is why uh, my mom doesn't listen to this podcast, nor will she ever, if I have anything to say about it. <laughs> Can you block certain people? <laughs> Can we make a list of people who I can't download this episode? she understands what a podcast is, and oh, I am not going to help her figure that out. <laughs> So, um, I don't know that my mom would call herself a feminist and there are a lot of ways that she raised me that weren't cool. Mm -hmm. 
uh, there are a lot of patterns of thinking that, that I've had to rewire by growing up with somebody like her. But one of the things that she taught me very early and very clearly is that when somebody does something to you, it's not about you. It's about them. So I think that's part of the reason I'm a, a fairly resilient person. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this went kind of into pathology where I was taught that nothing was ever about you. <laughs> right. So, I mean, again, there was some rewiring, but I wasn't overly traumatized by this situation because that is something I've always felt very clearly that you touched my body without my consent that's not about me it's not because I'm pretty it's not because I'm sexy to you it's not because I was innocent it's because I was there right right and it didn't didn't matter who was there it didn't matter who was there I was there so on one hand great (laughs) like there are have been things that have happened to me that have bothered me less than other women. I think that's a gift. Yeah. Um, On the other hand, on the other hand, so um, my husband and I were not in a good place around this time. We were having a lot of trouble. We were in therapy. Things were bad. Hmm. Um, So when I finally told my husband about this about a year later, it, uh, it did not go well. It did not go well. Which is so bizarre, having met your husband and seen you with your husband and the way that you talk about him. and Like, it's weird to imagine that that wouldn't have gone well. It did not go well. Um, he misunderstood what I was saying. It was not clear with what I was saying. Um, I tend to be dramatic. <gasps> no. Right. He thought the wording I used was for effect. And not because right. that's what happened. Right. Because to be fair to him, that's a lot. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's true. Right. Um, and we fought a, a lot about this. We fought a lot about this. Um, I did eventually tell him the whole story. And because he is my delightful husband, as was the case, like once we finally talked about how we had had a misunderstanding and I told him the whole story, he was in and is every time something like this comes up he's fucking appalled Mm -hmm. um he doesn't like it has never occurred to him to treat anybody like that like he's still we are happily married like (laughs) like like, we worked shit out it's all good right but even now like he does not ever assume that he gets sex Right. It is still a whole process right. of asking and consent and all of that. That's how it should be. It's absolutely how it should be. Although every once in a while, you know, again, because I trust him and we've been in a long-term relationship and we're happy, every once in a while I'll be like, just, just go for it. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, we don't have to make a procedure out of it. Right. But, you know, when I've told him about having my ass grabbed at the grocery store, when I told him about something somebody at work has done or said or yeah. you know feelings about women my family members have like he just doesn't get any of that yeah. it's not how he was raised it's not how he thinks it's not how he works right right um so so it caused some problems uh so that was in 2012 I told jeff probably in 2013 i don't really remember when uh, i told a couple girlfriends um, because again, we were having marital troubles. That was part of it. It kind of all came out right. during a very drunken girls weekend. So I told Jeff sometime in 2013. I don't remember where. In 2014, I saw a story on the interwebs about a guy who ran a massage business in St. Anthony, which is where I lived, who had been convicted of fondling a female client's breasts. Hmm. I didn't remember his name. I remembered that mustache. Yeah. So I called Massage Envy in Roseville and I asked them to look at my record to see who my massage therapist had been on my birthday in 2012. Because I remembered when it was. Right. And when she came back to tell me, I could tell that she knew why I was calling. I don't think I was the first woman that day to call. God. So, fuck. Now I had to deal with it. Right. So, 
Jeff, my wonderful, supporting, lovely husband, took me to talk to the police. Uh, we went to the St. Anthony Police Department, which later on became the police department that the entire nation knows as the police department that killed Flando Castile six blocks away from my house. But probably different officers than the ones you talked to. Yes, because I talked to a lady. There you go. Um, so we went to the St. Anthony Police Department because that's where we were living. And again, uh, me not knowing anything about the legal system, that's not new. Didn't know anything about it then either. Right. <laughs> so uh, we started to file a report. And once I said where it was, they're like, mm, you got to go to Roseville. Alrighty, fine. So we went over to Roseville, filed a police report, talked to a female officer, and we went home. Mm-hmm. So not too long after that, I was contacted by a victim slash witness services advocate from the Ramsey County Attorney's Office for additional information. I spoke with the prosecuting attorney uh, who informed me that several other women had come forward after the article in the paper and that there were five or six known victims. So if we extrapolate from the numbers that we learned earlier we know that 10% of sexual assault victims come forward, which means he had upward of 60 victims, most of whom have remained silent. Holy shit. So Tanya, who is the prosecuting attorney for my t- case, told me that the Ramsey County Attorney's Office was going to go forward with my case because, and I quote, I was a good victim. I I don't even know how to approach that. So here's what that means. Yeah. I'm a nice, white, middle class lady with a real nice job, great husband, a real cute kid, live in a nice neighborhood. I have a supportive community around me. I am surrounded by well educated people. No criminal record. No, no criminal record. And I literally had nothing to gain and everything to lose if this went public. I have a unique name. Yeah. I am not hard to find. Right. So, so basically had you been like a normal person, (laughs) (laughs) right? Not a nice middle-aged white, you know, white collar, white lady. Right. Like anyone else. Yeah. Then maybe they don't care. So this is fucking infuriating. And it's representative of our entire broken system. There are far, 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 far worse things happening to other women every single goddamn day. And I got my day in court because I'm a good victim. Yeah. So I decided if I was going to do this, I was going to do this. And I fully participated in the prosecution process. I was invited to the county attorney's office to go over the process and what I could and could not expect in terms of prosecution. I was told that if he was found guilty, he would likely get probation and 10 years on the sex offender registry. (laughs) I was not okay with that. No. So I wanted jail time and I wanted lifetime registration. Yeah. Um, I was told that jail time was highly unlikely Because he had received time in the county workhouse for the previous conviction. And the way that sexual assault laws are written in Minnesota, that would have counted as jail time for my offense because mine was before hers. So there was time served for sexual crimes already. That doesn't make any logical sense. Right. So when I was in Tony's office over at the county attorney's office and she like she was really great. She pulled down the law book. She showed me everything. She showed me the calculations. Right, but... Um but so so she tells me this that like the sexual assault tends to go concurrently since mine was before blah 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 and I was like so if I go home and murder somebody right. and I do my jail time and I get out do I just get to keep murdering? Right. Because that's what you've just told me gets to happen here. Right. Or if I have already murdered three people and then I kill someone in self-defense, but I get a little bit of jail time, then I don't get to serve any time for those other three people because because... they happened before and I've already served time. Right. I'm good. Right. If I stole from 18 banks and I served time in the last one, I get to keep the money. Right. So I was appalled, but then I learned some other things about Minnesota sexual assault law and I'm... I'm not as happy to live here as I used to be. 
We have a lot to work to do, my fellow Minnesotans. Vote for Ellison. He's a creeper. He's better than the other guy. What a great... <laughs> I I, I should it. go into campaign management. Right? <laughs> he's a creeper, but he's better than this asshole. Right. So I did make the case to have him on the sex offender registry for life. Um, for unrelated reasons that are a whole other very special episode. I've done some fairly extensive research on sexual assault and deviancy. And one of the things that I've learned is that people who engage in this behavior, assault, rape, objectification, pedophilia, whatever, they do that because... That's the way they're wired. Right. The guy that assaults women in vulnerable positions, because that's what turns him on. Right. He's like me, except what turns me on is tall, skinny, dirty boys with glasses. (laughs) (laughs) I'm wired that way. That's how I am. Somebody who is into children is wired that way. Right. And despite a perpetrator's best efforts, and some of them do try, If they're self-aware enough to know that what they are doing is illegal at minimum, their best imperfect defense is that the rest of us know that they are a problem and that there are limited ways for a perpetrator to find additional victims. So during all of this, I'd never told my family. Um, I once made a crack to my mom after Jeff and I had been married and had a child together that we had sex and she was appalled. And I'm like, Uh, (laughs) you've got a grandchild? (laughs) (laughs) To be fair, my mother has lots of grandchildren, but only about half of them were the result of anyone she knew having sex. She showed up at the hospital within a couple of hours. (laughs) (laughs) And he, I mean, he looks like... (laughs) And Jeff. And Jeff. Yeah. So, um, I hadn't told my family. Uh, They probably won't find out from this episode. Well, they're not going to listen to it. I had told very few people about my assault. Uh, I had told almost nobody that I'd gone to the police. But, reporters being reporters, it ended up in the paper. Oh my god. And although my name was not used, direct quotes from my report were. As well as logistical details of what had happened. Is that public information? Yes. Because it was a court document. Uh, well, it was a police report. Gotcha. Um, we hadn't gotten to court yet. So, yeah, it's a it's a legal document. Um, Minnesota is actually pretty good with sexual assault victims in that even in even in the court records, I'm only listed as DS. Right. Right. Um, but because there are multiple orders of protection, my full name address, everything's out there. Right. So he knows who to stay away from. Um, but I, also everything's out there. Well, and it's not super easy to find. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I have a unique name. Yeah. Um, but even I went looking for it and I couldn't find it. So. Oh, well, that, I mean, that's at least a little encouraging. Oh, because. although I did find out when I was uh, going through it, they did spell my name wrong and everything. So that might have been part of it because I was looking for how you spell it. <laughs> um, Silly you. Correct right. spellings and all. Right. How, how weird. So um, I could have elected on... The second order for protection to not have my name and address on there. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it um, and it seemed silly to have an order for protection, but you don't know who or where to avoid. Right. And I mean, there are more things that we'll talk about that was just like, fuck it, put my name on it. I don't care. Right. So direct, direct quotes. Um, I am happy to post the story links. All of those, they're me. But, I mean, again, what a great reason to not tell anyone. Because you're fine. You're fine with it. I mean, you're... Yeah, I'm not... You're okay with it. I'm not messed up over it. It's, you know, it was shitty. It was over. Like, we'll talk about the whole thing. But... But if you had the slightest, like... If there was some reason you didn't want your family to know, or if you were super ashamed, or if you were timid, right. or if you, then, then there you go. That's a really good reason not to tell anyone. Right. Even though I hadn't gone to the press, I didn't talk to reporters. Right. They comb through public records. That's what right. they do. They found it. They decided to talk about it because this guy already had a conviction. Right. And again, it well, wasn't just me that came forward. Although I seem to be the one they talk about in all the order. So I was granted a no contact order. Um, and I started to talk to my husband about what it might mean for us 
if this went to trial. So I want to reiterate that my husband is an amazing, supportive man who is raised by a strong feminist. My only regret that I have a boy child is that I know that my mother-in-law has teeny tiny now t-shirts, National Organization of Women t-shirts from the 70s that I totally <laughs> wanted to dress her granddaughter up in, but did not have one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So he was raised by a very strong feminist. My mother-in-law is a former state legislator. She right. is not shy about about yeah. her feminist beliefs. It has never, ever, 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 ever occurred to him to treat a woman like this. No. So when we started talking about if this goes to trial and I have to testify, he's like, oh, okay, great. Like, you're going to get up there and you're going to say what happened. He's going to get prosecuted. And there we go. And I was like, oh, so no. Yeah. So that's not how it goes. It is his word against my word. Right. And it's now his word against my word and her word and her word and her word. Right. But it's still, there's no evidence. No. There is nothing other than me saying what happened. And as we all know, the only defense that a perpetrator has against a victim is she's a whore or she was asking for it. Or I guess it never happened at all. Or she's lying. Yep. Yeah. She's horror lying, asking for it. Right. The fact of the matter is, I have a sex... <laughs> I have an extensive sexual history. Um, I was naked in a room with a man that I didn't know. And I expected professional courtesy to protect me. Right. And because of the way sexual assault trials work, my husband would be brought into this. Yeah. It would be a horrible, uncomfortable place for him. Right. For both of us, but really for him. Um, and I wasn't sure what it would do to our marriage. You know, this is the part in the process where you have somebody who's pled non guilty and you're talking to your husband about talking about your sex life in front of people. Like, so this is the point where even as resolute as I was, mm -hmm. I honestly don't know if this had gone to trial, if I would have continued participating. I don't know that. Um, I think the relationship, the relationship damage to my marriage would have been huge. Right. Um, and again, it's kind of non-consensual. Like he would have, my husband would have been subpoenaed. He would have had to talk about these things. Right. He would have had to share things that we don't talk about outside of our marriage in right. a room full of people he doesn't know, which right. is not his favorite place. Anyway. Ever, right. Really. Right. <laughs> um, I don't know that I would have kept going, honestly. Uh, during the pretrial hearing, he changed his plea to guilty to fourth degree criminal sexual contact, which is a felony, as well as another misdemeanor charge for another woman who had come forward as a result of the same article that I had seen. So I went to the pretrial hearing and I saw Wade Rio Wuchki hmm. for the first time since the assault. He was there with his wife, who was a very angry woman who seemed to know exactly who I was, even though I was only there as a spectator. Uh, he looked pretty bad. He had lost his license to practice. He was unemployed. He was ill. His marriage was in shambles. And he'd spent time in the Hennepin County Workhouse, which I hear is not a great time. Good. So, uh, so yeah, so she knew who I was. So after he pled guilty, I was contacted by a pre-sentence investigator. And I was offered restitution and therapy resources. And I turned them both down. I wasn't financially harmed by the event. Right. I didn't miss any. I, mean, I went to work that night. Right. right. <laughs> I didn't miss any work. I wasn't harmed financially. Um, I had really good medical insurance at the time. I had resources for therapy if I thought I needed it. I knew right. how to get it. I had an existing relationship with a good therapist. I didn't want to take away public resources right when it was something I could handle myself so I turned both of those things down um I was also invited to read or have Tanya read if I didn't want to do it an impact statement at the sentencing hearing and it, it was very greatly encouraged to do so by Tanya and by my advocate Astrea and I went back and forth uh, a lot about whether or not I decided to write one and I eventually decided not to there are a few reasons behind that, uh, but mostly it came down to this. Weedwitchki knew what he'd done to me, and he didn't care about how it affected me. Yeah. He only cared about how it affected him. 
And when it came down to it, my real beef with this entire situation wasn't necessarily with him. He was getting punishment. His life was made much harder. Uh, we'll talk about in a few minutes about how much harder his life has been made by this. Right. My beef was with the system. The society that allowed this to happen. The court system that wasn't going to protect other women. Right. From having it happen to them. And the law that he was prosecuted under that was written in 1983 that didn't much give a shit about women either. I'd gotten my day. He'd received some, but not enough punishment. And telling him that he's a shit stain on record wasn't going to change any of that. No. So he went to the sentencing hearing, and there was some sort of fuck up with paperwork. So there was a recess called, and uh, Tanya and Estrella and I went out to the hall to chat. Mm -hmm. This had to be very carefully done, because there was an order for protection. He could not be within 100 yards of me. Oh, Which yeah. is hard to do when you're in the same room, so... We overlooked it, but when they took us out while they were working through the paperwork snafu, like, I had to be taken out first. We had to go over here. He could not come past me. At one point, he wanted to come past me because I think we were on the way to the bathroom or something. And, like, I had to be consulted. I had to be moved. Like, it was a whole, like, square dance to right. get us to not make contact. Um, so that that was really interesting right and i wasn't again it wasn't particularly threatened there were lots of people there are lots of beefy people with guns around the court <laughs> so i wasn't terribly worried right. but it was it was just interesting to see kind of the the maneuvering that had to be done so the paperwork snap was cleaned up we were called back into court and uh i did not have a victim impact statement but the other woman uh we there were two cases tried together um this other woman declined to participate in the process she did write a victim impact statement and Tanya read it to the court. And this is the other horrible thing. Um, I know some things about this woman I'm not going to share. She elected not to participate or be named. And according to her statement, she never said a word to anyone about this. Except law enforcement and the county attorney. And that what she talked about in her statement was so much worse than what I went through. And she lied about it. And she didn't give full details. And he should have had a much higher felony conviction. But because of what she told them mm -hmm. and how she minimized and how she wasn't honest, he just got an additional misdemeanor charge. And he... He did not deserve that. Even during the hearing process with an amazing female attorney and an incredible female advocate, she still felt that she couldn't be honest or that she was deserving of being heard. And when I talked to Tanya after that, she didn't know any of that stuff either. That's the real worst part. Raid Rio Wuchki was formerly convicted of felony criminal sexual assault conduct for. This sentence included registration as a predatory sexual offender for life. Uh, overall statutes and registry for sex offenders in Minnesota is pretty weak. There are no residency requirements, so no, like, can't be within 100 yards of blah, blah, blah. For any kind of sex offender or for, like, the... Any. He's predatory. Even if it's against a child, like the the first degree or whatever. Oh. Um, no, a judge can impose some additional requirements, but the general sex offender, uh, <laughs> general sex offender registry, um, that doesn't have any requirements. The main requirements are you have to let the state know where you live and where you work. Um, however, he did have some special uh, conditions assigned. He is allowed no contact with children, including his own grandchildren. Good. Uh, without supervision. He cannot have unmonitored internet access at all. Good. His phone, uh, any electronics in his house that he has access to are constantly subject to search. They have tracking software. Um, it's Everyone shut down knows. tighter than your three-year-old's iPad. Huh. Which my three-year-old did spend like $50 on the Amazon store. So hopefully. <laughs> so shut down tighter than your... <laughs> well, and I don't want to make light of anything, but can you imagine not being allowed to get on the internet? 
So not only can he not get on the internet, he can't have a LinkedIn. He can't have a Facebook. He can't like, I can't nothing. I know that that is such an entitled privilege, like horrible bitchy thing to say and like totally millennial and whatever. But I, I can't imagine going more than a couple of days without being able to be connected to things well, that way. Not only that, we can't do like if we were court ordered to not have internet access, we can't have a job. No, anymore. we'd have to be fired. Yeah, like in there is no part of my job that doesn't require web access. The product we make is on I the know, internet. I, <laughs> but even like as a a teacher, where you know, in theory, you can have a book and a pencil, and it no, you can't. No, there are very very few jobs that you can do without internet. I'm thinking about David, who you know runs the the Chick fil A store. He his child <laughs> you know, employees occasionally have to use the internet at a fast food restaurant minimum wage job you couldn't apply for most jobs no uh uh-uh. you couldn't do any sort of research no you couldn't you can't look up a phone number like well no. i mean it's monitored right but he essentially can't have any right you so sure n- as hell can't do a true crime podcast no certainly not can't listen to it not well no. i mean i suppose he could it's <sighs> I don't know. Somebody else downloaded it for him? I suppose. Put it on an iPod or, like, I don't know. But How weird would that be? Well, also, just imagine, like, Jeff's kind of a Luddite. But, and, and I often, like, he'll ask me to look stuff up. Right. But imagine if he, like, he, like, he could. <laughs> but right. imagine if literally, like, hey, I need a phone number. I need the hours for a place. I need, Jesus Christ, I Bludgeon. Yeah. <laughs> How do you boil an egg? I have to fucking look that up every single time. Oh my god, no kidding. I everything. Right. It's just something that we're so incredibly dependent on, which I realize is a totally off topic subject. It but, is, but no, it is a be, it giant pain in the ass. Right. It makes me happy that that is part of his punishment because yep. if you're not gonna go to jail, where by the way, you do get internet access <laughs> in a lot of cases. Yeah. Then But monitored. Yes. Throttled. Yes. So that's basically what they're doing to him with, right. with devices. Um, other portions of his sentencing were probation for 10 years. Uh, there is a no contact order for protection uh, with me for 10 years, which after that I can renew and I will. He cannot drink, cannot take illegal substances, is subject to random breathalyzers and urinalysis. Uh, when I was researching this, I found his DWI from 2009. So that's apparently a problem. Hmm. He was sentenced to 36 months of confinement, which was satisfied with the 110 days he spent in the workhouse. However, if he violates any term of his probation, including the no contact order, he can be jailed for the remainder of that sentence, along with possible jail time for that violation. And he had to pay a fine of $50. $50. $50. $50. That doesn't cover anything. What What the fuck for? It's barely worth, like, processing through the county. It's not. I mean, it's not even. It's not. Yeah. $50. So because of the no contact order, this man knows my full name, uh, my full misspelled, except for my <laughs> middle name, name. Oh my God, they got both of your names wrong. Actually, the no contact order might have had Diana right, but Seacon was spelled wrong. But a lot of the letters I got were to Diane. Oh my God. He knows my date of birth. He knows where I lived until two years ago. Um, and he's been ordered to stay away from me. But the Twin Cities is not that big. No. And I have seen him. Well, and we live in the same neighborhood, basically. Right. Um, We definitely live in the same part of town. He doesn't live that far from me. Yuck. Uh, I've seen him at the grocery store. I've seen him on the street. I pulled up at a stoplight and he's been the next car over. That's so crazy. He still has a fucking mustache. So... I I wrote all this out yesterday. I thought about it. I've talked to Jeff about it. I've talked to a couple other people about it. And I really, when we, when we conceived this episode, I really wanted this to be empowering. I wanted it to be, you know, I, you know, I got my day. I got the thing. And this is, this is not an empowering story. It did the same thing that almost all women do. I froze. I didn't talk. I didn't call the police. I didn't seek justice. And even once I did, a couple years down the road, 
I was a good victim. And yeah. so I got my prosecution. His lawyer was smart and convinced him to plead guilty. Yeah. So my family didn't have to go through a trial. My husband didn't have to get up on a stand in front of people he doesn't know and talk about our sex life. Uh, and the la- lax sentencing laws in Minnesota means that he'll never get as much punishment as he deserves. This isn't a story about me being brave and winning. This is a story about a shitty person who benefited from the system. Yeah. And this is a story of a woman who even now continues to not always point out the ways in which she is marginalized. And when I look back at why I didn't say anything, and this isn't something that was listed in the Psychology Today article explicitly, but I think it under underwrites the whole thing. I fucking didn't want to. Right. It was my birthday. I wanted cake. And I wanted people not to touch my vagina. Right. I think I got one of those. But, you know, what about the guy that grabbed my ass in the grocery line at Cub? Yeah. What about the senior executive that dirty danced me? Oh, I did speak up on that and it was hidden? Huh. Yeah. What about all those things? This is an empowering story. It's not a good story. It's not... It wasn't my finest moment. And when I've told people that yeah, I've had somebody prosecuted for sexual assault, a lot of the times I get the, oh, you're so brave. I wasn't. I didn't talk for two years. I don't talk about it now. So all of that being said, Aaron and I want to point out that there's no wrong way to deal with sexual assault. It's very important that women are starting to stand up and talk and hopefully tear the blinders off of others. But you need to do what's right for you, mm-hmm. whether it's pressing charges whether it's moving on, whether it's not talking about it. We have to honor your decision to do that. I hope that your decision is to talk about it, but that's not right for everybody. And even if your decision is not to talk about it with law enforcement or family members or to somebody to get whatever it is that you need. Yeah. So if you are a victim of sexual assault, and odds are that you are, There are resources available, and your first point of contact should be the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-4673. We'll post all of this. If you want to help other victims of sexual assault, please also consider a donation to End the Backlog at endthebacklog.org. This organization's goal is to eliminate the existing backlog of untested rape kits across the United States. There are... Thousands upon yes. thousands upon thousands of yes. rape kits that haven't been tested. So this organization is raising money to um, have those kits tested to prevent a backlog from ever happening again. And they also have several major initiatives, including legislative campaigns, federal adv- advocacy, accountability and transparency, training and technical assistance, education, awareness and research. We'll post all of this in the show notes. Right. Um, we are also going to be real obnoxious on election day. Yes. Vote. Be prepared. Vote. 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 Research now. You have a couple days. Yep. You have things to think about. Then just go. It takes a second. It doesn't even hurt as much as a flu shot. Just do it. Your ballot is likely online, so you can see who you're voting for. You can do your research. The League of Women Voters has a voting guide. Um, there are lots of voting guides out there for special interest groups that are Uh, of interest to you Mm -hmm. to make sure that you're voting or conscious but again as somebody who is a dedicated third party candidate voter please don't do that if you are unhappy with the way things are going our only recourse right now is to fill the senate and the house with democrats who have enough veto power to stop the bullshit that is coming from the white house this is the most important election of our lifetimes I got not. This is such a depressing episode. I feel like I've got nothing. And I'm also sitting here and thinking about like all of the things, like other people's stories that I know, other stories that I have, like all of the ways in which it sucks and it's not fair. Yep. So definitely vote. Definitely seek help if you feel like you need it. Yes. And again, like we talked about before, if you're afraid. If you're in a dangerous situation, if you are afraid to reach out for help, reach out to us. We will help you. I feel like words of wisdom for today would be vote. Vote. Talk. Believe women. Yes. 
and especially to people that are not inclined to do so. We are going to skip shout outs. We are. Because it seems really wrong to put your names on this episode. Yes. And but if you've made it this far. Cookies. Gold star. <laughs> right. We will be back next week with much more fun things. Probably murder. Uh, almost definitely loads of blood. And like, yeah. Moments where we see how you got there and yet. <laughs> no, mine, mine isn't full of loads of blood, but there's loads of an other fluid. Ooh. Uh-huh. I am now both really curious and a little sick to my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> That's a uh, feeling I had as well. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Which we will talk about more next week. Next time. So thanks for listening to this one. I know it was rough. Yep. Um, feel free to share your stories too. Don't feel pressured. No. But... If you want to talk, like, l- let's talk. Let's, let's talk. Get let's... in the Facebook group or yep. send us an email or let's go on Twitter. It's There is a lot of power in everyone saying this is how it is. Right. And, and this is the way we're going to get change through. We need to elect women. We need to elect people of color. We need to elect liberals. Mm-hmm. We need to elect people who are interested in protecting their constituency, not profiting off their constituency yeah and this is not going to happen if we stay silent no the other thing that we did not talk a whole lot about but i want to put out there too is that we focused on women because there's a big problem with sexual assault against women and there's a lot in the media about sexual assault against women or lies that women tell (sighs) or but that doesn't mean that it only happens to women Nope. And it doesn't mean, I mean, we report it more but marginally, much. a tiny fraction of the time, but it doesn't mean it's any less awful if you're a man and this happens to you. Well, and honestly, I think it might be worse because there aren't resources. There aren't, right? you know, and, and not only is it not as prevalent, although it's certainly more prevalent than we generally think it is when you use that most recent survey, but... I feel like I can go to my friend group and be honest about my experiences. The guy friends I have, I don't feel like that is necessarily true in their core friend group. There is still a lot more stigma around men who not only are victims, but talk about their victimization. Right. And that's not cool either. No, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about like guys that I know. I've only ever had one man tell me about something that happened to him that was sexual assault or even related. Yep. Um, and I seriously don't think he would tell another man. And he's pretty open about it. Yeah. But it's just that much harder. Yeah. And to take it to trial, to tell any authority figure about it, to tell your family, like there's, it's that much worse. Well, in, I think what, not only that, men are expected not to be abused, blah, 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 because there's still a huge stigma against, you know, men who are victims of domestic violence. Right. You know, have women that smack them around. Right. Um, but I think, and I'm not proud to say that when I, the issue of male sexual assault was first raised to me, like, in high school, like, there's the whole, like, well, how do they rape you? How'd you get hard if you don't want to? Turns out biology is fucking weird. Right. <laughs> and also not all sexual assault is about penis and vagina. True. Yes. Both of those things. Well, and, and even rape against women. Yeah. It's not always penis and vagina. It's not. And it's also not always your body and your brain wanting the same thing. Right. And that doesn't make it your fault. No, but it also like... If you can have orgasms during childbirth, which is the least sexy thing I have personally <laughs> ever gone through, you can have yeah. an orgasm when you're being assaulted. You can get hard when you're being assaulted. Sure. Like, biology is sometimes very independent of your brain. Right. Right. All right. So we need to make a safe space for everyone. Yes. Man, female. Female? Nope. Man, female. Man female non-binary yeah so if you want to get in touch with us for storytelling support a listening ear 
all of our social media, Twitter, Instagram, Tell us that you voted so we Facebook. can like shout you out on the next episode. Absolutely. Ooh. Yeah. Send us pictures of your I voted stickers. We'll do shout outs on the next episode. 100%. No, not the next one because that is going to be recorded for election day. Yeah. No. One after. But. Send us a picture of your I voted sticker. Send us a note saying that you voted. Let us know. Yep. Shout outs 100%. Absolutely. Every single one. Absolutely. So do you want to give them all our... Yeah. uh, So the usuals. Crime Crazy Pod on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, uh, public group, private group. Page. Yeah. Page. Send a message. Send an email. You can uh, email us directly at crimecrazypodcast at gmail.com. You can send personal messages to us via Twitter or Instagram. We're mostly Diana underscore Seacon or Erin <laughs> <Aaron Plum>. <laughs> Um Also, this should not need to be said, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you want to like spill a story to us or just want somebody to listen... We're not going to use it as podcast material. Nope. We're never going to say your name. We're nope. not going to tell, like, absolutely but private. But if you need a safe space and you want two people you don't know to hear your story, if that's going to make you feel better, then tell us. 100%. Call your people. Call your people. Vote. 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 We'll see you on next week's episode. <laughs>